Okay, so we're transitioning uh, at this point to the question and answer session. Section, we, uh, we would like you to use the raise hand function. And then as you uh, come up in the queue, I will uh, call your name and you can, you can ask your question. Suzanne. Yeah, hi. Um, you know, thank you both for like, these really, really wonderful papers and, and also really moving papers. And, and, um, and again, I would sort of want to try to get the two presentations in dialogue with each other. And so here's, here's a question that I have, and, and it was uh, sparked certainly just by Juliet's term loss. And then also, Yanis, when you, at the end of your paper, talk about ontological questions, which sort of took me a little bit by surprise. And so here, here is what I, I would ask you to sort of reflect on, which is um, a distinction that's been made by a number of uh, theorists uh, but I'm thinking here in particular, the intellectual historian, Dominic Lacapra, who makes the distinction between well, what he calls absence and loss. And what he means by that is um, he, he equates, if you will, loss to historical questions. In other words, losses are always historical ones. You know, you lose a, a um, a friend, a lover, a country, an idea, you know, whatever it might be. And what he calls constitutive absence. In other words, it's a structural, uh, if you will, a structural loss that is constitutive of the, you know, the very being in the world, right? And in that sense, it's ontological. So, you know, Yanis and Juliet, if you may want to reflect on this kind of distinction and whether it would be you know, and how that would inform your thinking about loss and also repair. Sure, I can start us, um, start us off. I think, um, you know, so, so one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to, to think through is, is, is thinking about how to, how to think about the, the categories of, of loss that I'm interested in and, and not have it be, you know, sort of an overly expansive content, um, concept. Um, and so um, I think there is, um, you know, there's a way in which I would, I would say, I'm not sure how, um, how La Capra's distinction would, would map onto, onto mine because, you know, um, in thinking about my category of, of, of political loss, I think it seems I would be interested to think about how he thinks about historical loss, because one of the, the categories that I'm, I'm trying to think about when I think about white grievance, right, which is one of the key um, responses to loss that I talk about in the book, which is about um, contemporary racial politics in the US, is what happens when you have losses that are anticipatory losses, right? Losses that haven't yet occurred, but that are being sort of mobilized on the basis of the, the expectation of those losses, right? And, and that may not in fact actually be actually occurring losses in some way, right? It's not, for example, that, you know, the, you know, the, the sort of um, if you think about the sort of apocalyptic rhetoric that you sometimes hear about what's what's happening right now in terms of racial politics, right? It's it's certainly not a description of, of, of that seems to match reality. So I guess in that sense, I'm, I would be interested in trying to think about how something like that would fit in, right? Where it is it is experienced as a loss. But it's not necess but it's not something that I would call either a structural or historical loss. So I'd be interested to hear what you think about about where that would fit into to his thinking. Yeah, I mean, that's really, really interesting. I mean, the anticipatory loss category in particular is is really, really interesting. And you know, the other part of that is also when we, you know, the term, you know, structural loss 
in relation to something like structural racism, you know, has become such a coin in, in, this, in this conversation that, you know, that distinction between structural and historical is being really, you know, I think pushed against in really interesting ways. Yeah, if I can just say a word on, on, on this. Um, Susanna, I like your distinction between uh, loss and absence. And I think it's it's crucial um, for everything I was trying to say today. And I think for my work in general, because uh, I feel that you may have both things happening, at, but have both loss and presence. You can have broadly, you know, speaking the loss of a specific, Material apparatus. In this case, the loss of a loss of a, of a, of an assemblage of of practices that were you know in operation at that moment. But you have presences still, despite the loss. You still have presences in terms of remains, in terms of um, the traces that you could actually connect to. To, to, to different things that are happening at, in, at that place uh, previously, but also to other things from other locations. So I was able to make lots of other kind of connections by observing closely what remained there. So I think you can have loss um, and presence, but not absence at the same time. So I don't think that you can, uh, you can equate loss, as you say, loss and absence. So I see also loss in the more uh, abstract kind of uh, sense, whereas uh, presences can be very material and very specific and uh, very kind of uh, distinctive in their immediacy, I think. So our next question is from uh, Leon. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and thanks for these two wonderful papers. Um, my question is actually for, for Juliet, um, and I, I love so much the, the turn to Marlon Riggs and um, the, you know, looking back to this, the kind of AIDS moment to think through questions of loss right now. And actually, as I was listening to your paper, um, I was thinking about actually a, a chapter from Jose Munoz's book, Disidentifications, about um, Isaac Julian's film, Looking for Langston. Um, and that's the sort of, he does an attempt to sort of uh, read sort of mourning and melancholia in that film um, and how that film sort of stages a kind of melancholic relationship to a kind of foreclosed black queer past of the Harlem Renaissance in the midst of the kind of AIDS crisis. Um, and one of the things that uh, he sort of does in that chapter is think about um, what Isaac Julian is doing as a kind of call and response, um, this uh, kind of, um, you know, a call and response to history. And it seemed as, as you're reading the, the, the poem to, to Harriet Tubman, that there was a maybe similar thing going on there. And so I just wanted to hear maybe your thoughts about that. And also if, you know, how you're thinking about mourning and melancholia, and then maybe also how these forms of loss maybe appear in the realm of the aesthetic in some way, because I think um, Jose does an amazing job of sort of thinking through how, how loss and the aesthetic sort of intertwine in that, in that film. But thank you. Um, so, um, that's a, a very good question. You know, one of the things that I think, um, I, um, that became apparent for me, um, and this was drawing from, you know, a lot of, um, of, of contemporary, you know, was, was, I, I sort of came to, to thinking about this by on the one hand, right, there's this, this whole political theory literature on mourning, where um, people are writing about mourning and, and often their example is 9-11 is their, their point of departure to think about public and official mourning and how we might see it as a democratic resource. Um, and to contrast that, um, that literature with the work by people in Black studies like Christina Sharp, right, who are taking a very different stance, right, who refuse that kind of reparative imposition, and who are also, I think, drawing on these other traditions to say, you know, the sort of, you know, notion of, of, of mourning that, you know, that, that successful, right, mourning is overcoming, right, um, overcoming the loss, or moving past it, and then seeing, right, melancholia as this 
problem that it doesn't map on to these situations in which you have, um, you know, ongoing loss, right? Where how do you get over it when you're constantly, right? Um, as she writes about being confronted with, with black death over and over, either you know, or um, either in your own life or or externally. And as as Weidman points out in in that video, which is one of the reasons that I think it's so it's, it's, um, it's so powerful. It's like, you know, she's experiencing these things in her life, but she's experiencing them as a black person in the world too. And they, they impinged on her in that way. Um, so I think that, you know, there's something really interesting, um, for me for thinking about how, um, queer mourning and black mourning in this way resist those dominant categories, and, and I think there, there is, um, there are some really, you know, interesting connections there in terms of the, both the, the sort of, you know, and there's been some really interesting work too, wrestling with the, the question about mourning versus activism, right? I'm thinking about Douglas Crimp, whom I also talk about in the, in the project. And so I think there is a really rich way of thinking about, a, a kind of conversation, right? That um, that could be had around this question of, of what are some different ways of approaching mourning that have come out of these these spaces that might, you know, really challenge, um, particularly in political theory. I, mean, I don't know how other, you know, how it's being necessarily discussed in other fields as well. Um, and and aesthetics are, I think, um, you know, are our key, our key site where you see some of this work being done, right? Because so much of, for example, the activism is about, um, in some sense, cultural interventions, right? Um, and so um, thinking about the ways in which when you don't have control over the state and whom it mourns, that means if you're trying to make those losses visible, often people turn to the arts, right? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you so much. Adi? Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure it's, if it's a question or a reflection and, and a reiteration of what I asked yesterday uh, in the first session, addressing uh, Zachary and, and David. Uh, I think there is a, a very interesting built-in tension in both papers uh, between the moving uh, so somewhat idiosyncratic and certainly historical and specific example or examples that you are uh, um, analyzing and the, the attempt or the effort to conceptualize it. Uh, in a way that would not be necessarily uh, uh, haunted by the specific example. So it, it, in the case of loss, I think it's, it's, it's quite clear, uh, at, for me at least, uh, loss as, a, as a, an experience is something that may, may be incomparable between one, one person grieving to, to another, uh, but, uh, there is uh, um, the distribution of loss in society is always uh, unequal, but it is not about really about the, the effect of inequality per se, but about the regularity of losses uh, and their distribution in, a re in regular patterns or the order of loss, the order of suffering, the order, um, I call it the order of evils in, in, in society. Uh, and, and we, sh we must follow this order. I think, I think this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the, the conceptual uh, element there. It is it, very clear. But when we follow the order, then I, I think the, the question comes up again. So does, uh, uh, do certain historically specific uh, examples uh, force us to rethink the concept itself? Or is it simply an application of, of this uh, uh, general structure? 
And I, I, I was not less clear uh, um, thinking in the same vein about uh, Yanis' uh, presentation about remains. I was not less clear if this is if, if this is possible at all, uh, because even even if and, and, and I'm I'm hesitating. I'm I'm not sure if, if this is correct. But even if I'm thinking about uh, where you went at the, at, the, at the end of the of the talk, uh, very interestingly to think about remains and and, and temporality, and and to go beyond the the, the haunted. Uh, uh, the spirit, uh, the ontology, uh, the radiant the ontology to, to Bergson uh, and, and speak about duration, uh, I thought, well, but this is not always the case. The, 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 the logic, this temporal logic that you are trying to extract is not always the case uh, when we, are, we encounter remains. Remains may, may uh, pop up uh, as we encounter them and force us to temporalize in diff very different ways and not necessarily to create durations but to create interruptions or or, uh, or, or to collapse um, uh, ancient past with, with the present uh, or, or to do other things so I, I wonder if there is something about uh, about this particular example that that uh, uh, necessitate in a different way, the the um, you know the thinking through the historicity of the example uh, in a way that that makes generalization uh, much harder than in the case of loss reflection. Yeah, um, maybe I should uh, should start this time. Really. So um, thank you, Ari. This is all very very interesting and useful, and will make me think. Um, further and, and harder about this issue. Now, I, 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 was, I had in mind the discussion on mat, matter and memory in Bergson, in which he's, um, he's talking about memory, not in the sense we use it today, not in the sense of recollection, but for example, but as what he calls pure memory, as, as a, a, um, a state uh, of matter, that embodies different temporal states and different moments at the same time. So the, I read that kind of work by Bergson and also the Deleuzian uh, explication on Bergson in Bergsonism as an attempt to counter modernist modes of temporality, especially linearity, especially the idea of successive time. So I read that as an attempt to, to, to present time as, as coexistences. So I think that um, it applies to my mind on all matter. Matter as a category in itself embodies coexistences if we are to go with Bergson and believe also Deleuze on Bergson. Um, I think you are right in saying that matter or material things, if we were to, to have to speak about a category, do embody at times different temporalities and can actually interrupt specific temporal consensuses. You know, they can actually spring up at specific moments and disrupt a consensus, not only about time, but also about, you know, ideas, politics, uh, or states. But I don't think that as, a, as an event or as a process actually goes against the other more fundamental idea of matter as a category that actually embodies different temporalities. Like I think you, you can have both. You can have that a pure Bergsonian sense of memory, but also you can have the Proustian moment of memory as, as interruption, as something involuntary that destroys your, your sense of, um, you know, your, your consensus about, about things and your own kind of emotional or affective, affective state at the moment. I do believe that they're both um, uh, important to think with and, and consider together. To what extent this specific case is uh, applicable for, you know, useful for a more general theory or remains? Um, I think it is for the simple fact that it's not just, we're not just dealing with material remains of a certain episode. We're also dealing with specific remains of a, of a regime of bordering 
uh, in a specific location that speak to us um, in relation to historical processes, as I try to say, colonization, uh, racialization, attempts to, 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 to reassert re re um, also ownership. So if you are to believe Balibar about borders as signifying partage, in addition to everything else, it's also about who, what belongs to whom. So all these kind of um, specific uh, historical and political and social references that these material things embody can be combined and think together and with with the philosophical properties of matter vis-a-vis -vis temporality. That's why I was trying to combine that philosophical discussion with the discussion on haunting and relate them to haunting to colonization and colonialism, which is something that we uh, we need to do, I think, in relation to contemporary migration. Um, I, yeah, I'll stop here and allow others to, to chip in. Thank you. Uh, Sharon? Uh, thanks. Uh, so I have a thought kind of slash question for Juliet and then a thought um, for Giannis. So Juliet, I, I, I hear three different dimensions of the political in political loss in what you said. The first is the losses you're focusing on are especially ones that result from state action or inaction. Secondly, that there's um, they, they become sites for mobilizations and activism. But a danger with that second aspect of the, pol the politics of loss is that um, marginalized people and particularly black and brown people may end up bearing you know, bearing too much of the burden for attending and noticing and addressing the loss. But then I also heard somewhat less fleshed out, but more in passing, a third political sense of loss, which is that these are losses for which democratic citizens have an obligation or to which democratic citizens have an obligation to attend. And maybe privileged citizens or more privileged citizens may have stronger or different um, uh, or special obligations to attend. And if that third aspect of the politics of loss is right, then maybe there's some potential there for mitigating or making more even the distribution of the burden of, of attending to loss. So I just wonder what you, what you think about that. Um, and then for Giannis, I was just so struck by the haunted matter um, thing and, and coming after Juliet's talk, I, I, it, it occurred to me or it just made me think, you know, or wonder about human bodies as haunted matter. And, you know, we're not matter with the kind of multi-temporality of some of the objects that are the kinds of objects that archeologists <laughs> normally think about, but we do in a sense have multi-temporality in our bodies in that we carry our bodies, carry the remains as well as the presence of racial and gender and other colonial, other kinds of inequalities and violences. Um, so, you know, Juliet's mention of the higher mortality rates of, of black women in childbirth, you know, this is a uh, remains in a way of as well as a present, but also a way that our bodies carry remains. And I think also more privileged bodies carry remains. And we should see our bodies, those who are privileged as being haunted in a way by the remains that, um, that our bodies embody as the residue of past and continuing inequalities. So any thoughts you have about either of you about that? Would be welcome. Do you want to start? Or? Yeah, I'll I'll just say something briefly. Um, thank you for that, Sharon. That's very thought provoking. I think you're right that I sort of slipped in the third um, um, the third question of of, of um, democratic responsibilities to attend um, to losses, but it's not as 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 fully developed. And I do think that I I you know given my concern with with the unequal distribution of loss that I would, um, I am worried about this question of, 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 of the disproportionate work that some citizens have to do to make loss visible. So I think it's absolute, so I think 
it's absolutely the case that I, I do think the the responsibility to attend to um, to these histories um, of of loss um, are also would fall primarily or that, right that we need to have to think about those who are in a privileged position as having a greater responsibility. I was struck by it was interesting. There was a social media post by someone who is um, of uh, Jewish Ukrainian descent who put this post saying that um, that Germans had a particular responsibility to pressure their government to help Ukraine given um, the way that um, Kiev was destroyed in 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 um, in world war, you know in previous world wars and it was interesting you know and people push back of course with the usual like you know current and he, you know current um, people don't have um, uh, responsibilities for things that you know previous generations does but I thought it was an interesting way of thinking about this question of right it's both the usual sort of question of you have a historic you have an obligation because of historical wrongs but it was also about you're in this position now and therefore you know you have a special obligation to try to help right this wrong um, and I think that gets at this idea of you know how do we think about um, what our obligations are in the face of, of, of loss. Yeah, Sharon, I liked, I liked a lot your idea and I think you're absolutely right. I didn't speak about, you know, explicitly about uh, bodies and human, you know, human bodies, but I think you're absolutely right. Both the, the living human body and the dead human body, I think is haunting and haunted. I'm thinking in terms of the living that, Again, if we are to follow the idea that every sensorial perception is haunted by memories, is full of memories. So that's a haunting we carry with us all the time and actually shapes the way we, we react uh, today because that kind of the sensorial and the mnemonic cannot be disconnected. They are tightly, tightly connected. But even you know, in the sense of dead bodies and the bodies that we archeologists, for example, excavate or work with, um, we, we, we know now that so, there are so many, um, you know, negotiations, processes, social interactions, but also claims and struggles around the dead body, uh, claims to restitution, claims to reburial, claims to, um, to ownership. So the political lives of dead bodies is a thread that many historians and anthropologists have followed. Native American communities continue to claim um, um, the right to rebury the bones of, of Native Americans. So I think both the living and the dead body is definitely uh, a matter for hunting in many different ways. So thank you for that. Um, Abhishek? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Juliet and Yanis for your um, uh, for your presentations. It uh, obviously, you know, very much, is, you know, helping me to think through, I mean, the, you know, repair came up, but also different ways, the kind of reparative approaches with all its complications and fraud genealogies. So I very much have uh, a couple of thoughts, not questions. So, you know, feel free not to respond. Um, you know, first, a quick thing. Um, I too was thinking of uh, Jose Munoz's work, as I think uh, was brought up previously. Um, you know, uh, Yanis, with, uh, you know, when you're, you're, the way you were thinking about remains, right? I mean, he, you know, so wonderfully had talked about how you know, ephemerality is not disappearance, that uh, the materiality of performance also has, you know, the, the remains is in, you know, in the form of residues and tracks and traces, um, which was a, such a, has been such a fantastic influence in, you know, thinking of performance, it's something that disappears and how do you put it to political use, et cetera. Um, so uh, the, and, and the uh, kind of couple of thoughts, which, you know, I, as I was listening to both of you, uh, was, you know, kind of clarifying some of the things that I was thinking about is that this, um, you know, this kind of tension, I guess, or conversation for the lack of a better expression between, you know, when we're thinking of the, the you know, repair or the reparative turn, turn so to say, you know, as a, on, the, on the one hand, a kind of mechanism, a symbolic or a material mechanism of redress, which is, you know, facing the past, 
loss, you know, involves mourning, grieving. And, uh, you know, and, and then there is the kind of, um, you know, thinking of reparative actions or a gesture as a making, as a kind of world making, making, um, you know, act of making and remaking and world making, right? So I, I think that, you know, I just wanted to, you know, say that th this tension is productive and it's, it's probably helpful to keep this visible. And, and because this making part is where I was specifically locating this. And I'm thinking of, you know, the question that Tim had asked me, you know, repair, the, the what of repair, not just the how and the why. I mean, in, it's a very generative question, but in some sense, it's also not, you know, people have answered it very straightforward. You know, it's like, you know, the repairing of the world, we, we are, you know, a result of, you know, modernity and colonialism and slavery that we, you know, we, we are in right now. So I'm thinking of, you know, that's where if you think of design as a making, you know, as a way of world making, and if you're thinking about the very specific cultural background of design, which is the thing that has not been discussed enough, and which is where I would hope uh, interventions like mine would be located coming from this whole kind of humanities cultural studies position. Then, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, on the, so, so I, on the one hand, we talked about, you know, Patricia Stuelke's critique of, you know, how repair could fall into the neoliberal trap of really, you know, uh, keeping the status quo and not imagining radical possibilities. But on the other hand, I wanted to just mention the work of um, Olufemi Tayo, the philosopher who's, you know, really talking about that a serious political project of reparation should do two things. One, it should be global in scope, right? And tying it up with the all the anti-colonial decolonization movements and, you know, Black and Indigenous moves towards reparation. And the second point, which is really interesting, he ties it to climate justice. He said, you know, uh, uh, it, it has to talk about that, you know, some, so I, I just wanted to kind of put it out there that all of these things, um, you know, came, I kind of went through all of this all over again, listening to the two of you. So really thank you, um, you know, for that. Uh, can I just say one word about, um... The, you, you, thank you first, first of all, Alicia, I think it's a wonderful comment about repair vis-a-vis -vis remains, because this is something that, um, let's say in archaeology concerns a lot, because as, as you know, there's a whole um, discipline of conservation that what they do, it's not repair so much as kind of arresting the life of an object or a remnant. And several others have actually raised lots of problems with it. They've said, okay, this is a specific approach to, to things or to remains that creates a very artificial state of stasis, as opposed to allowing remnants to, to decay further, to follow their course, to um, scatter perhaps, or you know, become something else, transform itself. So I think that's something that we always are aware of and you know, keep in mind in relation to the remnants I'm, I was working with and I presented to you, my kind of immediate material response would be not repair, but curation of sorts. Selective curation would allow their journey or the allow their kind of their uh, affectivity to be enacted in other contexts. Like for example, in this context here, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, um, is it Annika? Yeah, um, I, Yanis, you, you, um, you commented on the inherent violence of counting, um, not just numbers, but identities, um, nationalities, race, religion, but, um, in order to talk about this violence, we must invoke, or, or maybe we find ourselves invoking the very naming that powers it um, and powers that counting. Mm -hmm. and, and in that way, it seems that um, the violence or at least the potential violence is inescapable. It's written into our language. So my question is um, for both of you, uh, how are you grappling with this seeming contradiction um, and how, how do you see language extending or, or expanding in order to encompass change without forgetting its history? Juliet, would you like to start on that or? 
Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll say um, something briefly. So I think this question of, of, of language is a really um, important question because, you know, there's a, there's a, there is a sense in which I think um, some of what I'm doing in this project is, 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 it's not exactly translation, even though a lot, you know, most of the people I'm writing about are writing in English, but thinking about putting, um, you know, thinking about, for example, going back to that, the issue like, and, and this speaks to actually Abhishek's um, wonderful comment, which is that one of my concerns about the way, for example, um, the literature on mourning and political theory often talks about Black grief is that is, and, and my critique of, of then the reparative move is because it ends up being a kind of parasitic world making, Abhishek, right? So it's like, we're going to use this to repair this larger project. And that in some ways, right, um, means that you, you, you don't attend to whatever the project of people whose who's, who's mourning traditions or whose who's grief you're, you're using are, are engaging with, right? And so, and so this question of, of, of language, I think, speaks to that, that tension, which is, you know, how do we, um, how do we engage with these, with these moments without instrumentalizing them in a way? Right, because you know, if you think about um, private grief that becomes kind of public mourning, there is this there is this ethical um, question there about um, you know how do we engage with these with these situations, even when it's it's let's say the families or the the you know the the communities of 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 people who are suffering who who try to make those losses visible. There's still a tension there about you know what are the costs of having to do that? I mean, I think Sharon was alluding to this, right? Um, um, and, so, and so I think this, this is, you know, um, about how do, we, how do we engage in this, in this work of thinking with people who are engaged in their own political projects in a kind of ethical way. And this may not be exactly what you meant by your question, but this is this is how I'm thinking about it um, in relation to some of the the issues that I'm dealing with. Right, this question of, of um, in some ways, right, is there a kind of incommensurability, or is there a way in which we can engage in 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 with other with with other people without imposing our own understanding of, of, of what their political project or their, you know, or, or whatever else they're engaged in um, um, is, I'll stop there. Yeah, just a, a word or two uh, to, to supplement what um, Leo was saying. So thank you for that uh, question, Annika. I think language is crucial in this context as in you know, all other contexts. Uh, and I'm thinking that in relation to, to migration, we may have to think about not only the border regime, but also the nation state and colonialism and colonization at the same time. Um, when I was um, interviewing the commander of that camp, he used to tell me that there are about 55 different nationalities in, in his camp. So he's thinking in terms of the nation state and he's thinking in terms of categories that the nation state had established. But think of how many different ethnic groups they were there underrepresented and becoming invisible in that attempt at categorizing according to the roles of the nation state. Or think that all, most of us do not necessarily have the linguistic ability to communicate with those people who are there in their own languages. And we're using the languages of colonialism. We're using English, we're using French, we're using these languages because of, of all these things. So there are all sorts of you know, violent acts um, that you could actually see enacted, being enacted at that specific context in, around language, in relation to language. I was uh, focusing just on the issue of counting in, that, uh, in the, my passage in, on, on the talk, and in relation to that remnant, which was what it was left the day of the fire in that office. But I think, yeah, you're right, it needs more extensive discussion about language, yeah. 
Great. Uh, I think this session is about to uh, come to a close here. So first, please join me in uh, giving a round of applause to our speakers. <laughs>